Hi there, my name's Matt and I'm a science teacher in Christchurch, New Zealand. Recently I've been getting my students to record the teaching moments of my lessons and also been recording other key skills and key concepts. Before I get into the story, I'd like to introduce you to the person who inspired me to even give this a go in the first place. I show videos of me drawing. I've, I've captured myself. I've archived myself. This is not good. This is Bob Ross on a budget. What do I do? Guys, I take a, when you, printer paper comes in a white box, flip it upside down, cut little holes in the side so it has four legs, cut a hole in the top and put your iPhone there, and you've got a document camera, a trailer park document camera, and I draw down here. And as I'm drawing, I'm teaching standards curriculum, shh, Trojan horse style, right? We draw an ant, I say head, abdomen, thorax, exoskeleton, insect, I sneak it in their ears while they think they're just being artists. So I've made 135 of these, and I'm not good at it. Don't wait till you're good at it. You'll never do it. If you waited till you have the money to have kids, how many would you have? <laughs> Archive yourself, just one time. Archive one thing. I archive changing a tire on a truck for my son. Because my son, I don't know about you, but kids today don't seem like they like cars like we did. I couldn't wait to get my first car. My son didn't even want to know how to change oil. He doesn't know how to change a tire. I said, son, let me show you how to change a tire. I'm not interested. I said, then you'll be standing beside the road with your girlfriend waiting for a man to arrive. <laughs> now he can change a tire. But what simple video of you showing your daughter how to change a tire so she's not at the mercy of whoever happens to stop on the roadside. What a cool idea. Or how about you just reading a story like the night before Christmas to the camera so your great-great-grandkids can know who you were and how you were. We can do that. That's kind of cool. You know, just look in the camera and be you. Just talk. Don't talk to the camera. Talk to every kid who's ever going to watch this. I put a paper face over the camera so I remember it's a human being. A lot of teachers, you put a camera, they get all constipated, you know? <sighs> it's kids. It's that girl in class who won't tell you she didn't understand. Getting a second chance, she gets to rewind you. That's a benevolent act. So I put myself on the screen and I do drawing while I walk around and mentor. I'm team teaching with myself. This Kevin buys me time to talk about gangs and meth and choices. If it wasn't for that, I would have no time. I'd be busy directing. You know? So they talk about the flipped classroom. There's a million reasons to do a flipped classroom. But my favorite one is being rewindable. I remember in eighth grade, Mrs. Zumbrum, my math teacher, taught math faster than I learned math. In front of 27 junior high kids, I'm not going to admit that. And she knew I was missing it. She kept checking with me. You understand, right, Kevin? In front of everyone. What am I going to say? Yeah, I'm ignorant. I said, yeah, no. But I didn't and she wasn't rewindable, you know? Now we have all these things. Don't wait, try it. God, watch my YouTube channel, guys. It's embarrassing, it's terrible, but I'm sincere. I err on the side of sincerity, and I'm never gonna be great. I know that, it's okay. So here's the journey I went on. I'm not saying it's the right journey, but it's what I did. I started by filming myself on my, on my cell phone, just talking about why I teach, the reasons why I like being a teacher. It's something I don't need to think about, I can just talk about it and go from there. I got used to seeing myself on film, I got used to the sound of my voice on film, and so on. Then after that, I, I have a professional learning blog, and so I started getting my ideas down and having a plan of attack. What was I going to do with the filming of my lessons? And then it came down to actually getting the students to film me and share it, get it on our class blogs, get it on my blog, get it on YouTube. Then, from there, I was able to reflect on the process and my teaching and refine both of them. And then from there, it's been a case of sharing my successes and my failures with those who want to know. I guess one of the biggest things that I found was a challenge that I had to reflect on was the time taken to do this to start with. One of the biggest things was how long it took to upload a video if it was too long. And actually, that also tied in with my teaching. Sometimes I taught for too long. So what I did is try to get my teaching down to no more than 10 to 12 minutes at the most to overcome those two ideas. I also would upload the video during the lesson 
so that it didn't add to my extra work outside the classroom. I tend to only grab onto these ideas to the technology and so on if I can see them really adding value to my teaching or to the learning in my classroom for my students. This one really stood out for me. So why am I doing it? As you can see there, I've got three main reasons. The first two to help my students and the third one to help me. If it wasn't for these motivations, I think I probably would have given up when things got pretty tricky for time management and so on. But instead, I think I've come to some good conclusions. And because I've got good reasons, I've persisted. In class recently, we've just done a titration between hydrochloric acid and a standard solution of sodium carbonate. So what we had was, in our burette, we had sodium carbonate and it was a concentration of 0.0543 moles per litre in this example. In the conical flask or Erlenmeyer flask below, we had an unknown HCl solution and methyl orange and we said that when the methyl orange was pink in the HCl, when it turned sort of an orangey colour or even as far as yellow, that that's when our titration was completed. What we found was that we ended up needing an average of 18.3 millilitres of our sodium carbonate. What I'm going to go through next with you is how we can use this information here to find the concentration of HCl. And sorry, the one thing I did forget is that we had 20.0 mils of HCl. That was collected in a pipette, so that's how we knew its concentration exactly. So the next thing is, how do we calculate this? Well, being chemistry, I always like to start with a balanced equation. I'm actually only going to give the first half of it, because that's what I'm going to use to do my calculations. So Na2CO3 plus 2HCl is going to go on to make water, carbon dioxide, and 2 moles in this of NaCl. But I'm not going to show the rest of that, because it's not overly relevant. What I am going to do is I'm going to turn this into a bit of a table, because then I can find some things out. Where I've got the balanced equation to give me my mole ratios, and if I go down the side here, I've got amount which makes it close to these. So one of these reacts with two of these. So therefore, if I had one mole of sodium carbonate, there'd be two moles of HCl. I also am going to have my concentration here and my volume in litres. Okay, so my units are going to be moles, moles per litre and litres for all of these. What I found, what I do know already, is that my concentration of sodium carbonate is 0.0543 moles per litre because that's what I made up for my standard solution and I found that I needed 18.3 mils which when converted is 0.0183 litres. I need to make sure I turn this into litres or I'm not going to get the correct result. I also know that I used 20 mils of my HCl so that's 0.0200 litres. Again must convert it into litres or I'm going to get the wrong answers. Right, so the reason that I put these into columns is that using the relationship of concentration equals amount over volume, so this triangle here, I can actually see which one I'm missing and work out my calculations. So I can see in this first column I'm only missing one thing, my amount. So what I'm going to do is cover in in my triangle and see that it says that it's going to be concentration times volume. So I do have those two things, concentration and volume. So if I multiply those two together, 0 0.0543 times 0 0.0183, I get 9.9369, so I'm going to say 9.94 times 10 to the negative 4 moles. Now this next step is very important. This next step is why we wrote the balanced equation. If there was one mole of these, there'd be two moles of this. So if there were two moles of this, I'd have four moles of this. The process I'm doing to go from here to here is times two. I'm going times two to go from here to here. 
So therefore, I must do the same in my moles area here. So I'm now going to multiply 9.94 times 10 to the 4 by 2. Now with the rounding off and everything, it ends up being 1.99 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Now here I'm just trusting my calculator. So I'm not rounding any numbers off yet, I'm just using the numbers in my calculator, but only recording them in my table to three significant figures. Now the question would have been asking us to find this value here, the concentration of the unknown, the, the hydrochloric acid. So again I go down to my triangle and I cover what I'm trying to find, and I see that it gives me N over V. Well I have those, there's my N and there's my V. So I put this number here, which I haven't taken out of my calculator, I divide it by 0 0.02 and I get 0.0994 moles per litre. And now I've actually got my answer. So I've done everything I need to. To be careful, I'm going to put that down here. The concentration of HCl equals 0.0994, and I'm going to remember my unit, moles per litre. We we'll notice that it's 3 significant figures, even though it was 0.099369, I think it was. We only record it to three significant figures because that's how precise our equipment was. Okay, so we've learned about melting, evaporating, condensing, and solidifying, or freezing as we commonly call it. What we're going to do now is we're going to put a solid in here, and it's going to be heated. And we're going to see what sublimation is, which is another one of our changes of state. And the reason you've got a lid there is that you'll see something happen that's probably a little bit unexpected. So what I've got in here on here is a hot plate, so it's getting nice and warm. And what happens is the particles in the solid spread out, they heat up. So just like when you're melting ice, they spread out. But what happens that's different, and you might be able to see now if I put my lab coat behind it, is you can see that it's not melting, but it's actually turning into a purple gas, isn't it? So there's no liquid in that. If I tip it, there's no liquid. It's all solid or the purple gas. So what do we think sublimation is? This is sublimation. What do we think it is? Um, uh, solid turning into... Um Yes. Good, without becoming a liquid, 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 liquid first. Liquid. Well done. Whoa. So this is what sublimation is. The opposite of it has got a really easy name. It's called reverse sublimation. So if I cool it down again, then it turns back into a solid. And that's what I'm going to try and do now, is try to collect some of the solid up on this one. It doesn't always work, so... I'm going to have to edit this video if it doesn't behave. It's liquid. No, that's from, that's just a drop of water that's come out of here. No, it's not going to work. That's a shame. So sometimes you can get the get the gas to collect in, on there and then it's colder so it turns back into a solid. So reverse sublimation happens. What actually is it? Is it like so the chemical there is iodine, which some of you might have seen as a brown liquid that's used for treating your cuts because it's an antiseptic, it kills bacteria and things, makes things quite, um, quite sterile. Actually, you can see it. You can see like little stars almost. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. it re-solidifying up the top. So it's actually worked better than I thought. So it's sublimed, hit the colder glass up the top, and turned back into a solid. And that's those little, almost like stars that you can see. What it's doing is it's catching the light from our camera, and that's why you can see it sparkling. Only the solids can sparkle, not the gas. So it's subliming down there, and up here it's doing... Shining. It is shining, it's solid, <laughs> so... What was that? Reverse subliming up here, well done. Okay, so your task today is to describe what you saw, explain what's happening in there, and then generalise why it turns into a gas without turning into a liquid first. That generalising is really hard. Even my Year 11 students struggle with that. So you must be able to do the first two up here, so we might get Tim to pan up so you can look at the notes. You have to do these two. This one over here is an extension piece of work that you can do if you really want to try it. But you must do these two here. Okay? The key word in the explain is particles, like it was with everything today. 
I've tried to keep the actual filming and uploading and sharing of all of this really simple. I think if it's simple, then anyone can do it. It's also easy to teach someone else to do it. So really, we're filming only using a cell phone or maybe a small digital camera, then uploading that onto a laptop and then uploading that to YouTube and then we have class blogs so it, it is quite easy to put a link in there. The little icon you see there with the little question mark is something that I'm going to use in the future for capturing things on my computer. I don't have a Mac, I have a Win Windows based platform. So this thing here, this community clips is something that's available free and can help you to capture what's on your screen if you don't have a Mac. As well as the things you can see on the screen in front of you, there's a couple of other things I'd like to add. One of those is if you are going to share your teaching on YouTube or any other public forum, I recommend setting some ground rules. Things like the students only film the teacher and the demonstration, whiteboard, whatever's actually being worked with. Avoiding filming any students' faces and when you're doing the teaching, ask the students to wait with their questions until the end unless they are actually happy for their voices to be heard on the video. One of the key things with actually filming your teaching is to share it. Unless, of course, you're just doing it for your own professional development. But really, the pedagogy behind this is for it to be shared so that students can review it whenever they want, wherever they want, on whatever device they want. So that's why I like using YouTube. As I said earlier, we also have class blogs where we can share these things and where students can post comments and so on. But I find that the sharing is the key to making it good for enhancing the learning of my students. Right, so it's time to put everything together. What have I discovered through my successes and failures? Well, basically, I've got myself a nice, neat little, almost lesson routine that I'd like to share. This is how I run my lesson. Normally, the students come in and I have a graphic organizer up on the board that shows what we're going to be doing today. It usually has a student-based task that they can be doing, even if it's something as trivial as reading a paragraph. While that's happening, I set up to do the teaching and or demonstration of an experiment. And the students film this when I get started. They then often photograph my notes off the board and then give me those as well, share those with me. Then the next stage of my lesson is that the students get into some higher level thinking group activities. They're not all the same, they're often very differentiated. This gives me time to start uploading the film to YouTube and so on. Once I've got that started, I can then work with the groups, make sure that they're on track, on task, and actually coping with the task. Then I return to my computer to now put that YouTube video into our class blog or into our learning management system. Then I can go back out into the classroom, working with the students on their group work until basically the end of the period. Then at the end of the period, we do a quick summary of the work they've been doing. And then on the data projector, I often show them that yes, the video is uploaded to the blog or the learning management system, and that it is also available on YouTube. And that's often when I show them their homework and things like that as well. I've found this lesson sequence has bought me the time to do all of this basically within one 50 minute lesson. And I'm not having to follow up a lot of extra work outside the classroom to do with this side of my teaching. That means I've still got that time to do the marking and so on without having to worry about the filming. And here's some ways to follow or keep in touch with me. If you're an educator, please do feel free to follow me on Twitter and I'll follow you back. And there is my YouTube channel and my professional blog. So if you do want to see the other ideas that I've sort of come up with regarding teaching and the learning in my classroom, then you'll find most of those ideas mentioned and talked about in that blog. Thanks for listening and I hope you've got something useful out of this today.